Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Garden Hour, brought to you by SDSU Extension each week at this hour. I'm Rhoda Burroughs, SDSU horticulturist, and I will be your host this evening. Tonight's panelists will be Christine Lang, SDSU Extension consumer horticulture specialist. And Christine, what will you be sharing with us tonight? Well, Tonight, I'm going to be giving an update on how our cool season annuals are doing in the garden, talking about deadheading, and I think the theme of the night is going to be water. <laughs> Thanks. We look forward to that. And our other panelists tonight will be Amanda Bachman. Uh, Amanda, what from the world of creepy crullies will we be learning about tonight? <laughs> Thanks, Rhoda. I have a couple of pictures of things that I've been finding in my yard, some good bugs and some bugs that are not so helpful. And then we'll also cover some talk about how to prevent things like mosquito and tick bites. And I will also have a little bit of update on how my plants are doing after it got so hot in pier this weekend. <laughs> and I think all of us are looking out in our gardens and wondering, hmm. Is this plant going to make it or not? Um, I'm going to be starting tonight uh, and I will be talking about transplants and heat shock and some other some other photos that were sent me this week that I thought might be of interest to our viewers. So I've been getting a lot of, of photos lately of plants that people are wondering what's wrong with my plant? Is there a bug eating on this? Maybe like spider mites or something. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a couple of those. On your left, we have a melon plant or squash plant. And um, you see the whitening along the outside edges of the plant there. And a little bit of browning too. Normally, when we see something at the very ends of the leaves, it's telling us that the plant can't quite get enough of whatever it is, nutrients, or in this case, water out to the ends of the leaves. And so that's where we see the, the symptoms first. And in this case, this cucumber had been in the ground for a week or so, but Again, we hit that hot, dry period, and those tender leaves are just trying to hold on to their water, but they can't quite. So it can't quite, the root system isn't quite developed enough to feed that. And that's probably why we see the yellowing as well, is that the root system isn't quite developed up enough yet to, to take up enough nitrogen to feed the plant. In some cases, it's a good idea to use a uh, transplant, transplant solution, uh, something with a high phosphorus in it. Although I don't normally recommend a high phosphorus because a lot of our soils are fairly high. Uh, in this case, that phosphorus helps get those roots established a little bit quicker. And so that can help ease the, that transition for our plants. On the right hand side, it's a little hard to pick out the plant from the, from the straw in the background. But what we're seeing is a little bit of curling up on the edges. And again, that browning around the outside edges. And you might notice a little bit of a white powder. And in fact, that's not powdery mildew. That's, that's an insecticidal dust that was applied to this plant. Uh, but we see some dieback and even uh, some pattering of the leaves on this plant. And this is a tomato, which <laughs> may be a little hard to make out. But again, it's that, that sudden heat that our plants aren't quite adapted to, and it just sucks the water right out of the plant. And so again, we see that die back around the outside edges of the plant. And in a minute, I'll show you a little bit about leaf rolling in tomatoes, which is another thing that we see quite frequently at, at this time of year. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the picture on the lower right was one that came to me this week. That's an asparagus spear, believe it or not, uh, that has gotten very flat, maybe an inch across and maybe just like a quarter inch thick. And uh, the person who's, who's asparagus this was indicated that they have this quite often um, in, in certain areas of his planting. Um, this is called fasciation, not fascination, but fasciation, although it is kind of fascinating to me. Uh, we see it, we can see it in all kinds of different plants, uh, even in, in annuals, but usually in perennials, but in the upper right hand side, uh, is a sweet potato vine, an ornamental sweet potato vine, and that's doing the same thing that's trapping this. Uh, Dame's rocket in the middle, which is kind of a weed. Uh, you see the normal uh, stem in the middle. And again, we've got that flattening that the arrows are pointing to. And in the left-hand side, it almost looks like a daylily leaf in the middle of of the Coreopsis. Again, same thing. So what causes this? It can be strictly genetic. Something just kind of went wrong during the translation process. And, and so we'll, we'll see this genetic aberration in, in any kind of plant really. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. Um, with asparagus, you and with some of these others, you may have a little bit more chance of getting it if there's been some insect feeding or some other kind of mechanical damage. But for the most part, this is a, a genetic mistranslation. And it's, it probably doesn't harm the plant at all, but, but uh, just doesn't look like what we expect. Next slide, please. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today was herbicide damage, which we begin seeing about this time of year as the weeds start uh, really progressing in fields and, and lawns and people get out their sprayers. But it can also be confused with, at this time of year, we see leaf rolling. Tomatoes in particular, uh, and certain varieties of tomatoes, the leaves will just roll up. And, we see in the upper right hand side, the leaves are rolling up. Now, if you look very closely at that photo, you'll notice that there's not uh, misshapenness. If you took that leaf and spread it out flat, it would like, look like a normal leaf. So we know it's, it's the leaf rolling. It's not a virus and it's not uh, herbicide damage. The two photos on the left, on the other hand, are herbicide damage. If we took these leaves and unrolled them, first of all, we probably couldn't get them to go flat. Uh, but second of all, if we managed to or, or pounded it flat with a book or something, uh, they would be very distorted. And so that's, that's the hallmark of, a, of herbicide damage. Now there is, there are a couple of viruses that can take leaves and distort them, but they generally most of those make them long and strappy. Uh, they don't curl them up into tight little balls like we see here. If you felt these uh, leaves where you can see they're pretty thickened, at least in tomatoes and potatoes, uh, they will feel kind of rubbery. Uh, Tomatoes and potatoes are kind of the canaries uh, in the plant world for herbicide damage, particularly the 2,4-D phenoxy types of herbicides that your, the rest of your garden can look just fine and your tomatoes got hit. And so people think, well, it can't be herbicide. Everything else is fine but these are particularly sensitive to it. So they'll be the ones, first ones to show us damage. The other plant that is kind of a canary for us is uh, the grape leaves. 
and, and grapes are very sensitive to herbicide as well. With them, we don't get this curling up as much as the leaf kind of shortens. It gets uh, misshapen, but the veins get much thicker and kind of whitish. And with them, they feel kind of not rubbery, but rather leathery. So those are a couple of different uh, issues that we're dealing with this time of year and things that you might might look for. And I'll take a look for the questions here. My carrots are being eaten by rabbits. I have a fence. What else can you do? <laughs> Pretty much you can either get a dog or get a better fence. Um, you know, I've never had trouble with carrots, with rabbits eating carrots. I've always thought that was kind of odd that, that you know, all the nursery tales talk about carrots and rabbits and, and the carrots and the, my rabbits have always ignored the carrots, but I guess yours read the nursery tales and, and mine didn't. So Rhoda, while we're waiting to see if anyone else has questions about vegetables tonight, um, I have a tale about rabbits. I had a, a row of freshly planted pepper plants. Um, this was for research in Iowa. And it's really important to note that there was an arborvitae hedge nearby where all the rabbits lived. But we came along and the tops of every single pepper plant had just been clipped off. Um, and I, at the time, didn't know what had happened and hadn't put two and two together. But one thing we noticed and I learned was a telltale sign is all of the cuts were at a 45 degree angle on those stems and those rabbits had gone along and tasted several of the peppers before they decided that they didn't actually want to eat it and they just wanted to de destroy my research crop and move on with their day. <laughs> <laughs> So we ended up using some rabbit fencing in that situation as well until the plants were established. And once the stems were large, um, we were no longer worried about it. So a story about rabbits on peppers, if anyone else has seen that before. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say my uh, cousin in Pennsylvania, I was catching up with her over the weekend and she has rabbits in her yard that uh, like to lay on her flowers and also eat some of them. And she actually has success with some of the rabbit repellent uh like pellets she said the product that she was using it was like concentrated like egg and something else that doesn't smell very good um and she said that worked pretty well the only thing is that you have to reapply after it rains which i mean <laughs> hey <laughs> we're not having too much of a problem with that but um some of the you might want to look and see what kind of repellents are available locally and some of those might work as well that's a good good point. I've got some that you know some of the liquid fence or or some of those that really do smell quite awful. Uh, you don't want to apply them right underneath your window. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I see we've got a question in the chat about an ash tree dropping honeydew on the deck. Yeah, it's aphids. <laughs> <laughs> and I've uh, I've got a solution to some of your aphid problems in one of my slides. So we'll come back to that one. All right. And I see that we have a question, Rhoda. We might want to work on this one together. So the new leaves on my hydrangea plant are curling. I water and fertilize them. What could be wrong? So if it's a new, if it's a hydrangea that's been there for a while, I'd be curious if it is perhaps an over application of fertilizer, if, it, if you fertilized recently, and that could be a sign of fertilizer burn. Um, I'd also be curious to know if this is more of an Annabelle type hydrangea, and it could just be, again, heat stress or um, based on the location of the house, if it's getting too much sunlight, because if it's an Annabelle, um, type hydrangea, those need more shade typically. A lot of our panicle hydrangeas, so I'm thinking of, oh, there's one with straw, like strawberries and cream or some of those that have, um, you know, the, the thicker wood and leaves, those can take more sunshine. But if it's an Annabelle type, it might just be too much heat right now. Rhoda, do you have other thoughts on that? I think you're probably on the, on the right track there that, and, and Again, you overwatering can cause yeah. almost the same symptoms as underwatering. 
but with our soils this year, um, be careful if you're watering, making sure that it's that it's going down more than just the surface. It's mm -hmm. so easy to think, well, I've I've done a really good job of of hitting this plant. I you know I I'm sure I put on an inch of water that's pooled right around the plant. But then if you take a shovel and shovel down, I was working in the garden last week already and before the heat. Uh, and the first like three inches were relatively moist, not too bad. And the further down I got, the drier it was. So uh, you might want to take a, take a trowel or, or a spade or something and, and see just how deep that water actually is penetrating. Yeah, and we did get some more information. We don't think it's over fertilized. Um, we don't think it's an Annabelle type and they are on the east side of the house. So, um, so light shouldn't be the issue in this case. I would check that water is getting down to the roots of the plants or that again, as Rhoda said, that it's not sitting soggy wet either. Um, but um, check the water. And then always, as always, feel free to submit pictures through our Ask Extension portal on our website. And Amanda will drop that link in for us. <laughs> um, thanks, Amanda, because we'd be happy to look at pictures and dig deeper in that with you as well. So thank you. <laughs> and I, th I think it does bear repeating again and again that our new leaves, even if they developed outdoors, probably are more tender mm -hmm. and I've noticed even my burr oak tree is kind of wilty a little bit in this uh, heat and wind so um, curling up is actually the way the plant is protecting itself against water loss the st stomates are usually uh, on the inside and and so it's losing less water so it's a way of the plant protecting itself but a picture is always good too. Yeah, and we actually have a, a guest panelist that just messaged us. So we're, right. gonna give a, we're gonna give a shout out to Dr. David Graper, our former um, horticulture specialist who is reminding us that heat is really tough on hydrangeas, even if they're well watered. So <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get through this folks. Um, I should point out, you know, things like my Swiss chard crop and my raised beds, they're well watered and they are, you know, they have nice big leaves and they're kind of drooping inward to protect themselves during the heat of the day as well. So um, don't lose heart, folks, where our plants are doing the best they can. <laughs> and I see Karen, another master gardener, uh, it was confirming that, that curled leaves are kind of a common subject right now. And, I, and again, you can get curling that's from herbicide damage. And this is the time of year we start to see that too but it also might just be the, the heat and drought. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, Christine, you have some fun pictures for us tonight. Yeah, let's, I mean, I have one sad photo, but let's look at some happy or decently happy photos first. So, um, you know, cool season annuals, they have their place in the garden, such as our snapdragons, our lobelia. We have a lot of wonderful plants that give us early season color, um, such as our pansies. Of course, they get a lot of credit in the fall more so than the spring. But I just want to give a give a reminder that based on our current spike in temperatures, don't panic if you start to see some of your plants, such as your snapdragons. Um, if they, you know, if they've bloomed out and you've deadheaded them, what stay tuned. I'm going to have a photo of deadheading next. Um, so if you've removed all of those blossoms and they're not setting flowers again, it's likely that you're not going to see another bloom from some of our plants like our, um, our snapdragons, as well as our osteospermum, or also it's called African daisy. That's one that you, it's fun to buy in the garden center because they're always in full bloom right away in the spring. They make a great gift for mom for Mother's Day or a great Memorial Day planter. Um, but you're probably not going to see those bloom again. Their life cycle, um, some of our annuals are cool season. And so when we get these warm season temperatures, they're, they're going to stop flowering. And as we get cooler temperatures again in the fall, if you've deadheaded those plants and you're keeping them watered and cared for, 
they, you should see blossoms again in the fall, or you might, I'm not going to guarantee that, but just realize that it might not be that your snapdragons and your osteo osteospermum are, are dying out completely. They're just kind of going somewhat dormant, taking a backseat. And, um, my, my answer to this in my own bag, this is a photo of my stat friggins, is I have verbena and zinnias planted in there. So I'm going to let them kind of take, take over in the garden and we'll see how I'll have to give some updates this fall on how the snapdragons fared. And I point out lobelia. So several of our annuals like our lobelia, our alyssum, our dioecia, they are also um, cool season annuals. If you're buying it in a six pack, it's typically still propagated from seed. And those are some of our older varieties usually um, that may not be as heat tolerant. So again, um, you can see here in the photo, my lobelia is looking awesome. I'm waiting for my sweet potato vine to pop and it's gonna kind of fill that space. Um, but I realize that this lobelia is gonna to start to struggle in the heat. Now, I want to add that there are many heat tolerant hybrids. So if you're buying at your garden center, you're buying specialty annuals. And typically if it's in a four inch pot or a six inch pot or a hanging basket, that's probably one of those newer specialty hybrids that garden centers are selecting those plants from the catalogs because they want it to um, continue to bloom and be an all summer performer for you. So. Um, just realize that some of your lobelias and alyssums might decline again in the heat, but there are also a lot of heat tolerant options out there if you're looking to still add more, more color to your garden and keep shopping for plants. Um, I'm trying to rein myself in and stop shopping for plants, but I'm keep trying to add one more container to the deck. So it's, it's an addiction. <laughs> so speaking of wanting more flowers, um, if you want more flowers on your flowering annuals, um, it's this is a great reminder that deadheading is a really important practice. So this photo here, I'm showing cosmos, and with that blue circle, you can see that I am snipping that spent bloom. Cosmos have a thicker flower stalk, so it's not one that I could really easily pinch off with my hands without causing more harm than good. Um, sometimes it's really tempting to just pop those flower heads off on top of the on top of the stock but realize that that's going to die back to the base anyways and so the plants um you know then you just have this messy brown stock that's dying on your plants but I mean that back right away the plant's not wasting any more energy on setting seed on that plant and you can see um, lower down in the photo that there are going to be more blossoms that um, are are ready to ready to pop so that you'll have more season color um, and again, the practice of deadheading, the goal of annual plants is to flower and set seed. And so we're, we're being kind of mean to the plant in the sense that we're preventing it from setting seed, but the reward is we do get more blossoms. So that's why the practice of deadheading is so important. And I'm showing um, on the photos on the right and with the other circle um, there in the photo, with the yellow circle, I'm showing how to properly deadhead geraniums. So again, sometimes it's really tempting to just snip off those, the top of that flower stalk, but you will be rewarded if you go all the way down to the, to the leaf access and you snap that stalk off right there. And this is something you can do really easily by hand and it's actually very therapeutic. Um, I, I find deadheading geraniums to be very satisfying. <laughs> it was one of my favorite tasks at the garden center because everything just looks beautiful when you're done and there's just something about that pop and getting that flower stalk removed that's really satisfying. And some of our some of our annual plants, um, you know, sweet alyssum, if you do see that it's um, overall or your lobelia to deadhead a plant like that you can trim that back in general when most of the flowers have bloomed you can trim back about a third of the growth to the foliage and that's um, one way to help plants survive if there's you know if we've got on a long extended heat wave and they're kind of bloomed out anyways and then they will um, in many cases set more blossoms so it can also be a way of of getting us through this heat wave if your plants are already bloomed out so the lobelia in the photo I showed you I would say later this week or early next week I'll probably trim those back and see where we're at in terms of blooms all right we're already busy on the theme of what a rough 
rough week and rough weekend it was to be a plant. So these were my scarlet runner beans. They're in pots and my goal is to have them crawl on the um, crawl on the 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 poles of my deck, deck railing. And we were gone for three days. We had watered, you know, watered as until those pots were completely saturated where before we left for the weekend, but we knew we might come home to some situations like this. So you can see again the, the necrotic tissue on the edge, the dieback. But looking at the photo on the right, I can see that the new growth seems unharmed. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about this yet. And this is, you know, this is a second floor balcony. It was catching a lot of wind. Water loss from those plants was extreme. And I also realized that those black, um, those black railings might be difficult for the plants to actually trellis onto and grab onto in the heat. So I'm considering putting string in between the railings for the plant to grab onto instead. So just another example, another depressing photo, which brings me to the theme again of water, water, water. So the photo here on the right, um, I this is this is garden mix in my raised beds. I have some topsoil compost. There's a little bit of sand in there for drainage. Not that um, I need a lot of drainage right now, but I also don't want my plants to be waterlogged. But there is quite a bit of peat in this mix as well. And a lot of our peat-based potting mixes, and especially if you're thinking about your, your 10 or your 12 inch hanging baskets or um, potted containers that you've purchased from a garden center, the ones that they put together that look so lovely, if those get really dried out, it's not uncommon to see that peat-based mix shrink away from the edge of the pot, or in this case, the raised bed, you can see a little bit of a gap there on the left. So as you're watering, um, you know, rehydrating these pots and planters, start by watering the middle of that soil and you might see everything start to run out from the edges. So you're going to want to do additional watering to continue hydrating that soil. Or if it's, um, you know, a 10 inch or 12 inch hanging basket, something that you could put in a container of water to um, submerge it and let it take in, take in water. Um, from all sides, that would also be really beneficial. So just realize if if plants have gotten really dry because you were away for the weekend, that, that potty mix might have shrunk up and um, your first water application, most of it's probably running right out. So I, when I water my raised beds and containers, will do a rotation of applying some water to everything, allowing that to soak in, making sure that the peat mix is expanded, and then I'll do another rotation. So I get my steps in while I water my plants. But again, giving everything a nice deep soak. And I do dig down in fact and make sure that things are, are wet all the way through. And that's what I'm trying to highlight here with this photo of uh, petunias is this was a new petunia planting at my parents. And and we, we transplanted the, the four inch pot into the garden and then gave it a nice slow soak of water. So this was done just by hand with a garden hose with a water breaker on it. Um, you don't wanna, you, I really encourage gardeners to avoid using those spray nozzle um, watering, watering wands, if you will. Um, those spray nozzles, I think those are great for, you know, washing concrete or washing the car, things like that. They're typically very hard if um, on, on our perennial and annual plants and shrubs, because they tend to blast soil away from the, the root system and do more harm than good. So, you know, a nice slow soak um, for each of your plants or a watering wand and remembering that your goal is to get the water in the soil. Um, you don't have to just sprinkle it on the foliage. So getting a nice good soak on all of those annuals. And we recently updated an article on irrigation. So I, when I hop off um, of sharing my screen, I'll link to that irrigation article for some other ideas on how you can be irrigating your gardens during this heat wave. And finally, I just wanted to share some, some beautiful photos and let's not lose hope. Focus on um, nurturing and planting some drought tolerant annuals. I would encourage you if you have some extra space in the garden, go out to your garden centers and get some moss roses. That's the photo on the right. They have nice succulent foliage so they don't lose water as quickly and they do have greater drought tolerance. And the photo on the right, 
is my petunia planter. It got upset and knocked down. It was a 10 inch pot. It got knocked over and flattened and broke a bunch of the, uh, of the foliage off in a windstorm. And I saw this as an opportunity. I trimmed that plant back. So again, using kind of that um, overall deadheading method of just trimming the overall plant and transplanted it to a larger pot with more soil so that it would hang on to water and have more room for those roots to grow. So hang in there, everyone. Um, it's it's a tough week to be a plant or a person, but we're, we're gonna keep watering and we're gonna have beautiful flowers this summer. All right. What types of questions do we have? We've got one that what's the proper way to dead head petunias? You just talked about that a little bit. Yeah, I talked about it a little bit. Um, and it's important to note that a lot of our, our older petunia varieties, they they do need to be deadheaded um, to um, to continue performing in the garden. So if you don't end up doing an overall trim, you can um, deadhead those plants by, again, just removing those flower stalks. You saw those little stems. I'm actually gonna pull that photo back up really quickly. Uh, there we go. So you can see the, these are the, the flower stalks right here. So if you want to do just one by one in your hanging basket or pot, Snap, snap or snip each of those off, you can, or you can use a shearing back method. Um, a lot of our newer petunia hybrids, you might notice that they'll say no need to deadhead or self-cleaning. So those are gonna drop those seed heads naturally and still set bloom. So they're not gonna, not gonna be setting seeds. So um, I, I don't know that I should endorse this method on live TV, but we had a woman who owned a garden center where I grew up and she had large petunia beds and halfway through the summer when all these old fashioned petunias were just kind of looking crummy and lanky, she would set her lawnmower really high and just go over the whole works to shear it back in one fell swoop and then they would look gorgeous again. So um, again, maybe not the, the method that you want to choose. I would recommend using hand pruning methods for your pots and containers. Always be safe when using gardening equipment. Um, but yeah, that's how to deal with petunias. Um, so for the bean plants that were stressed, you cut the leaves off. I am thinking about it. I'm going to leave them for now because again, in the center of that leaf, there's still a lot of um, chlorophyll that can catch, um, catch sunlight and contribute to photosynthesis. Since those plants are still so young, I'm going to leave those leaves on for now. Um, but as I get a little bit more new growth, I'll probably remove some of those stressed leaves. Also, I want to be able to continue to take photos to show all of you. And on peonies, how much of the stock should be deadheaded. I would, um, just like in that Cosmos photo I showed, I would go down until you can see, you know, if this is your stem and your flower stock, I would go down to where you can see leaf shoots and cut that stock back right there. And then just enjoy the beautiful foliage. All right. Well, I wanna make sure to give plenty of time for our next guest who also has plenty of beautiful photos of flowers. So. Let's welcome Christina Lind from McCrory Gardens. Welcome, Christina. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So I just have a couple updates of what's happening at McCrory Gardens this week. Um, again, we do have that Father's Day picnic coming up on June 20th. So check our social media and um, website, things like that, to get information on that. Um, we also... Um, have our again for mark the calendars is the garden party august 6th and we have um um books in bloom growing gardeners our, our kids programs which you can still sign up for um we had a really fun time last week with all the kids and and so just know that those are you can sign up for any of the weeks so that's still open to sign up for as well as our third thursday with amanda bachman which i'm really excited for again the pollinators class excited to have that in person and also Zoom. So that one is one of the only ones that is both options. I'll be filming it via Zoom. And so I'll be manning questions and interacting while she does it live in person. So I'm excited for, for that class to come up um, in June 17th. 
Um, you can go to the next. Thank you. Um, so some things that we're doing, we're finishing our annual perennial planting this week. Um, so that's pretty exciting walking the gardens now. Um, you can see all those beds are getting filled and it's just getting really beautiful. The biggest thing we're up to is watering, 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 because everything is getting pretty dry. This is that kind of time that, you know, every spot that the sprinklers don't quite reach perfectly, you can see them. It's that kind of time right now where the lawn is kind of brown and whatnot. Um, yeah, you can go on to the next one. So what's in bloom, as you saw in the last slide, and again, because I just love that <laughs> photo is peonies. The peonies are beautiful right now. Um, these, every photo that I put in here, I took today. So they're all um, blooming right now. Though That's that peony today. It just looks phenomenal. And the whole peony garden is just covered, covered in blossoms. It's really beautiful. So, um, and that one that I featured twice there is Coral Charm. It's, 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 far. it's always one that we love every year. Can go on to the next one, please. A few other things that I highlighted, um, uh, right, those two on the left is red feathers or Echium amonum. This is another kind of unique biennial plant that every time it's blooming, I just get really excited to see it, um, as well as the foxtail lily, that eremaris, and they're, they're on the right with the yellow blossoms, just this giant spike in the middle of the, <laughs> in the middle of the great perennial bed behind the visitor center there, and it's just a really neat um, bulb that I think it was thought to be more of a zone five, but it's been coming back there for us for probably five or six years now. And it's just such an accent plant that I wanted to highlight that. Now I got a couple more slides of things blooming. Um, here's a couple more um, in between the great, uh, the great perennial bed in the terrace and the perennial garden. I mean, you find these all, I walked out the door, I was gonna look for things to bloom and I could get like five feet without finding tons of things to show you guys, I had to pick and choose. So the well, two on the left is the Burnet, the Stangisorbum menziesii. That is just such a neat little bottle brush. It's so fun to look at up close and you can see it on the bottom left, like how it opens like that. Um, just really neat how it kind of pops out those little, um, and it also has a little fly in it, if you can see it up close. And then on the right there is the Bowman's root or the Galenia foliata. That's just a really neat one that you don't hear of very often. Um, the powdered root, I think, was used by Native Americans for um, for medicinal uses, I believe, like a diuretic and, and um, for like upset stomach and things like that. But it's worth looking into. It's um, because it's just a really lovely plant because you can see really airy white flowers. Okay, we can go to the next. Um, so just a couple more here to highlight. Um, we have our white fringe tree, which is another really rare one. I thought I wanted to share some of these ones that are kind of rare, like the Chionanthus virginicus. This is those, it's probably between 10 and 15 feet tall, um, tucked in the gardens. And you can see those really pretty frilly white flowers on it. It's just kind of a rare, neat, neat little surprise in the garden. And then as you can see, our annual containers and annuals are planted and looking lovely. And so just a lot going on. You can't get very many steps in without seeing something neat to, to look at. So we hope to see you all in the gardens and see what's blooming. Does anybody have questions for me at all quick? I have one, Christina. How tall does that Galenia get? That one, oh, I, um, I almost put left in another photo to show a little bit of scale. It's probably about three to four foot tall. I would say it's, um, well, I don't know if you can see me because <laughs> you can't get married either, but I would say about three to four foot tall. It's pretty shrubby and it's about three. It's probably three or four foot wide as well. So it's a good size, but it's also very compact and solid and for a nice little plant. So. Any others? Christina, okay. oh, yeah. you mentioned holding the date for garden party. Could you tell us just a little bit more about what garden party is, especially for those yeah. of us who are new to the state? <laughs> yes, absolutely. So garden party, um, it's been a tradition for many years. I think it's over 30 years that we've been doing garden party where um, it's become a tradition now we're at 10 a.m. We have coffee in the gardens and it's free admission all day and just a day to kind of celebrate the gar botanic gardens. And um, 
We have um, usually have some tours going on at 6.30 is kind of the big. We have the uh, uh, SDSU ice cream, free SDSU ice cream that we serve. So everybody's usually really excited about that. That's one of the things it's known for a lot for is the ice cream part of it. And we usually have music playing. And so all that is in the works. And um, it's going to be a really, really wonderful year again. And as Amanda mentioned last week again, too, and we're hoping to have the Insect Fest as well on September 11th. So that's just another, another couple things to keep keeping you awesome. going on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. You always uh, inspire us to go out and <laughs> do some planting. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, awesome. Okay. Amanda, are you ready to tell us all about creepy crawlies? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, things that are happening in the insect world. I. I'm here in Pierce, South Dakota. I did a little traveling down to Murdo today as well. So I've kind of got the central part of the state covered, but grasshoppers are happening, <laughs> especially if you are in more of the central or Western part of the state. Uh, you can see the picture on the left there is a tiny little first or second instar grasshopper. So if you are walking around your garden and you are noticing grasshoppers um, as things, if areas continue to stay dry, grasshoppers are going to feed on the stuff that's nice and green, which might be your garden. Um, so it's a good idea to go out and scout, see what's out there. Um, and maybe start planning what control measures you might be willing to take. Um, grasshoppers, if you are in a place that has chickens, um, birds are great at eating these little guys. Um, I've got some friends who do a market garden uh, just outside of town and I asked them, you know, how they were handling grasshoppers and they have guinea hens and that's, that's their solution for keeping the grasshoppers from uh, mowing down their livelihood. So keep an eye out for them. They get harder to manage the bigger they get. Um, and I am kind of thinking that we might be getting, you know, we might get into July and August and have, have something of a grasshopper plague. So that's not going to be super fun. And then on the right, the picture is actually of something good that you want to find in your garden. I was just, you know, as I'm watering, it takes me like twice as long as a normal person because I am constantly looking and getting distracted by whatever insects are on the plants in my yard. And I happened to notice that my box elder leaves were kind of shiny and sticky, indicating that there's aphids around. And I took a closer look at some of them and I noticed that there were um, ladybug larva, but then there were also a bunch of ladybug pupa. So on the leaf there at the bottom, that is actually um, a pupa of some sort of lady beetle. And hopefully here pretty soon, especially since the temperature temperatures are so high and the warmer it is, the faster insects develop, I should have a new crop of lady beetles patrolling my yard uh, looking for aphids to eat. And I did notice that my milkweed has started blooming. Uh, my common milkweed is very short this year. It's about half the size that it normally is. And I think that has something to do with how dry it was last fall and even winter. Uh, we had a very open winter in Pier as well. So my, my milkweed was showing the strain, but it started blooming. And I even had ladybug larvae that were patrolling the blooms looking for things to eat. So lots of natural enemies out there. And those are critters that you want to take into consideration when you're doing any kind of insecticide application because they do not bounce back as fast as the pest species. Uh, next slide, please. Cool insects that are back. In Pierre, the monarchs showed up last week. I was out on uh, La Fram on Thursday evening and managed to catch a monarch that was flying around. So I'm very excited and I hope that they find my milkweed and maybe lay some eggs so that I can have some caterpillars to keep an eye on this season. I know in Sioux Falls, I was down there on, ugh, I think about right before Memorial Day and there were already monarch eggs on the milkweed um, down there at Good Earth State Park. So monarchs are back in South Dakota. If you're somebody who follows their migration, you know, keep an eye out for them and maybe you'll see them hanging around in your yard. And now we'll move on to the uh, slightly less fun side of insects, <laughs> talking about insect bite prevention. So I have our friend, the mosquito there. Uh, mosquitoes enjoy feeding on 
the blood of creatures. In our case, they like humans. The two species we have that are the main vectors of West Nile virus uh, feed on birds and then humans, which is how um, West Nile virus gets sort of moved between um, those populations. But it's really important to you know, work to prevent uh, mosquito bites, prevent tick bites, um, so that you can avoid some of those arthropod vector diseases. So if you're outside at times when these critters are active, so for our vector mosquitoes, especially between dusk and dawn, it's super important to you know, cover up as much as you can in the heat. I know that's kind of tough. Um, but you know, long sleeves, long pants can help um, to sort of physically prevent these insects or these critters from biting you. Um, but also make sure that you're wearing an approved um, insect or arthropod repellent. There are a couple of different um, active ingredients on the market. I know some people you know, avoid DEET for various reasons, um, but DEET is very effective against both ticks and mosquitoes. Um, and I know we've had a lot of ticks uh, showing up in South Dakota this year. We've got the American dog tick is widespread throughout the state and is sort of the most common. But if you're on the eastern third of the state, you do have to keep an eye out for things like the black-legged tick, which is the one that vectors Lyme disease, um, and also the lone star tick, which is making a little bit more of an incursion into South Dakota. And that one vectors uh, the alpha-gal protein, which uh, can make you allergic to red meat. So take your tick bite prevention seriously and make sure you are using something with an EPA approved active ingredient. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that repellent labels will tell you how long the product lasts as far as how long it works as a repellent. It'll also tell you how frequently to reapply and then also what to do when you're, you know, out of bite range. Um, and so for some of that, it, you know, maybe laundering your clothing or taking a shower, um, but you do want to make sure that you're using one of those officially labeled repellents and um, not something that you cooked up from a recipe you found on Pinterest. Um, so I do take arthropod bite prevention seriously and I know we'll have an article coming out um, later this week, um, might be in the next edition of the Garden Newsletter talking a little bit more about how to prevent mosquito and tick bites. Uh, next slide, please. And then yeah, on Saturday, <laughs> it was 104 degrees in Pierre and my garden suffered. You can see I've got some walking onions there on the left and the sort of thinner, like newer shoots around the edges got just got completely toasted to a crisp. Um, on the right, that is a young elderberry. I just planted it last year. So this is its second year, but you can see those uh, sort of burnt spots in the middle of the leaves. I'm noticing more of that kind of damage um, appearing on some of my garden plants. And I think as we were talking um, before we started the call, and I think Rhoda also covered that some of this damage can, or people will mistake it for insect damage. So I do just also wanna reiterate the point that if there's something wrong with your plant this year, or not this year, but this week, um, odds are good that um, it had something to do with the temperature and the heat. Um, and the, the damage uh, shown there on the right is, is definitely from the sun and not from any of the critters that have sort of free range in my yard. So that's what I've got slide wise. Any questions for me? Amanda, while folks are thinking of their insect questions, I have a question for you and Rhoda. Can you tell me more about walking onions? Because I have very limited experience with these, and I've heard of them one other time in Iowa, but never grown them myself. So my walking onions came from a friend in Pierre. She has a whole bunch in her yard and gave some to me last year, and I planted them, and they just did really well. Um, on the tops there, they'll sort of get another, like, cluster of bulbs and then the thing is like that gets heavy and falls over and that's how they walk. Mm. Very cool. Um, if you can maybe share some photos of us later when you're when your onions start walking <laughs> that would be really fun. <laughs> have you grown walking onions before Rhoda? I do have a, a patch in my yard and I don't even remember where they came from but probably a master gardener uh, <laughs> and and I mostly ignore them but every once in a while when I want just a little bit of onion flavor I'll go out and, <laughs> and harvest it. 
Yeah, I did use the greens a little bit, and they are a much more pungent, uh, much more pungent than like chives or something. Like, so they, it does not take a lot to get the desired effect. <laughs> Awesome. That was going to be my follow-up question about how to translate it for <laughs> cooking purposes. <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, taste first because, yeah, they, I noticed mine were, you know, fairly strong. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, Amanda, while we're seeing if anyone has questions, do we want to tell folks what we were up to in Pierre this weekend? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> besides being very toasty, we had an awesome native plant sale at East Pier uh, Garden Center. So a whole bunch of folks from Brookings from the Native Plant Initiative came out with some really awesome, you know, native perennials, things that we really normally don't see in greenhouses and pier. So I was super grateful that you guys made the trek out with your <laughs> trailer and full of ice and plants. <laughs> Yeah, it was a it was a hot day to be out there, but um, one of the goals of the Native Plant Initiative is to help help our gardeners, such as those of you on the call, get more native plants in your landscape. And some of the benefits of that are, of course, these plants are regionally adapted to grow in our soil conditions, to grow in our climate, and a lot of the plants that we focus on. Um, no surprise here, they tend to be prairie plants that are adapted to hot, dry, full sun conditions. So if you're looking to add anything to your perennial garden this year, um, definitely ask your garden center what native plants they have on hand. And if you're looking for more resources, we have our SDSU Native Plant Initiative. And there is going to be a follow-up plant sale, kind of an additional pop-up plant sale. So stay tuned for details on that. Either Amanda or I will share that on a later, a later episode of Garden Hour. I have to admit that I got some shell leaf pensament one year and I just kind of spread the the seed around and let it seed itself and now I have patches in my yard in my <laughs> lawn that I mow around until they're done <laughs> blooming each year. Nice. Well we have a question if Christina is still on about how tall the fringe white fringe tree gets. And I'm also curious whether it has a scent to it. Hey, yeah, um, it is noted to reach 12 to 20 feet in cultivation, a little bit bigger out in the wild, but 12 to 20, ours is probably about 10 feet tall. So, and you know, I don't, I think it's, it's been there since maybe about 2015 or 16, but that's kind of a estimation there. So um, yeah, that's, and the scent, I haven't noted a scent on it, I guess. It's not overly fragrant, at least. <laughs> so. uh, I noticed that I had the, the question about, so that ash tree with the honeydew. So right. treating trees for aphids, generally the aphids are all up in the tree somewhere and you would need to do some sort of um, systemic insecticide in order to kill the aphids, um, which I don't recommend because if the tree is blooming, that is going to end up in the blooms and that's going to harm um, anything that is visiting those blooms. Um, but if you notice that you've got a whole bunch of, probably if you've got that much honeydew, you probably have a whole bunch of ladybugs, uh, green lacewings, surfed fly larvae. There's probably a lot of things up in the canopy of your tree that you can't necessarily see that are eating your eating the aphids that are up there. Um, and sort of with the next rain, a lot of that stickiness will uh, hopefully go away. So I would say, you know, go ahead and maybe, you know, pressure wash the deck if that's getting a little too gummy. But aphids are nature's plankton or, you know, terrestrial plankton. They are the food source for so many of the good garden insects that we have out there. Um, so, you know, on trees and stuff like that, I am, you know, personally not an advocate for trying to do any hardcore um, treatment of aphids. If it's your prize rose bush that you're entering into the state fair, like that's another story. Um, but aphids just sort of out there in the environment, uh, they are food for a lot of other cool insects. 
Rhoda, I'll go back quick. I did check quick and just they're noted to be slightly fragrant. Oh, okay. <laughs> so not something I really noticed when I'm around it, even taking photos, but apparently maybe if you took a spring inside, they do have a slight fragrance. So. I'm, I'm a fragrance person, so I choose my iris and my and my roses by what kind of fragrance they have as much as what they look like. Yeah, that's a great. That's great. I actually we talked about that a lot with roses recently. How um, we hope that they do that they're continuing or doing more of cultivation for the scent of roses because mm. to me that's the main reason to have a rose. I'm not a huge fan of them otherwise maintaining around the thorns, <laughs> but if they have a nice scent, then it's worth it. So. Well, and it's funny you bring that up, um, Christina, because last week I was at McCrory Gardens helping evaluate the rose trials that are on site. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the questions they ask is, you know, can you discern a fragrance and how much and, you know, do, do you enjoy that? So I think we're seeing that come into some of our evaluation trials as well. <laughs> that's great. Yes, I'm so glad. <laughs> I think it's a big deal. You know, you just what is better than walking into a garden and it's just lovely little scented, you know, flowers. So yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. Amanda, I'm really excited for you to answer that last question. <laughs> yeah, I see. Uh, uh, do, marigolds, <laughs> do marigolds repel aphids in the garden? So marigolds are in the chrysanthemum family, genus, whatever. I'm an entomologist guy. So as far as like plant classification, I never took a botany class. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. I also never took a soils class. <laughs> But so they are, you know, in with the chrysanthemums and um, the pyrethroid insecticides are derived from chrysanthemums. So there's like a little kernel of truth to, you know, marigolds have a, you know, a history or a lineage of being able to be used for um, pest management. However, if you think about marigolds, if you have them planted around your border, and you think about insects and they've got wings, uh, you can still have stuff flying into the middle of your garden that's, you know, gonna miss the marigolds. So there's lots of good reasons to plant marigolds. Um, they're an annual, they bloom all season, bees do like them. You'll see all sorts of cool little bees burrowing into, you know, in between the petals to get to the pollen. Um, so, you know, definitely if you enjoy marigolds, totally plant them. However, do not go into it thinking that they will make some sort of magical force field over your garden and protect it from insects because they won't do that. Is there any plant that's going to do that for me, Amanda? No, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's I was really hoping not. there was going to be some follow-up for that one. No, so, and that's the thing, like, you know, when you're, you're, you know, going around, you know, monitoring for pests, you know, keep an eye out for the predators, monitor for those as well. And like, in my case this year, I've got two zucchini plants and I've got two cucumber plants. So if I start seeing any of my squash pests, I only have four plants to deal with. I'm probably going to be handpicking a lot of those um, pests off instead of trying to, you know, spray or do anything like that. But yeah, they're not going to do, um, you know, any sort of magical repellent, but marigolds can also be, you know, sort of a good sort of nursery area for some of those natural enemies. You know, our little parasitoid wasps need nectar and pollen too. You know, it's just sort of more good habitat for pollinators. So you get some better fruit set on your zucchini, which, you know, hey, <laughs> never have too many zucchini. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there's lots of great reasons to plant marigold, but thinking it's some sort of super, you know, it's got some superpowers. Um, I'm just here to, I guess, like bust all of the uh, Pinterest myths. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have you come back next week and talk more about <laughs> Pinterest. Uh, We're talking about pollinators next week, Rhoda. <laughs> I'm sure they're on Pinterest too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, Thank you for joining us tonight. And if you did not get your question answered tonight, or if you go home and, well, you're probably already home, but if you're <laughs> uh, thinking about the show or come across something in your yard and have questions, uh, you can wait until next week and we will be happy to answer them. But if you'd like it answered before then, uh, you can, we invite you to call or email the SDSU Extension Garden Hotline 
and uh, you can contact your your local regional center um, and you can also uh, go to online to extension.sdstate.edu go to the garden and yard tab and you can select the problems and solutions and that's where you can submit uh, photos or or other kinds of questions so you have a number of options there but probably the easiest one is just to email one of these folks or give them a call and if they don't know the answer then uh, some of your panelists tonight will be looking at it and and it may actually show up some some night on garden hotlines so um, so send them in and uh, have a good week. <laughs>